Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. The chairman of the Federal Reserve. That news conference ended almost as soon as it started. The Fed chair <laughs> thinks we're restrictive. Here are the scores for you. In the equity market on the S&P 500, boom. Vertical, almost straight away as soon as he started speaking. The equity market positive by 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq up by 1.1%. The small caps bouncing back from a very, very bad April. Here in May, up by almost 2%. If you switch up the board once again, if it's a Fed decision day, apparently it's a rally for the two-year. Yields are lower by seven basis points, 4.9622. And I think it's about 4.20 a.m. in Tokyo. Dolly Yen looks a little something like this. I imagine the Ministry of Finance is a little bit happier. It could have been a whole lot worse. Dolly Yen, 157.49. Take a listen to what the chairman of the Federal Reserve had to say. I do think the evidence shows you know, pretty clearly that policy is restrictive and is weighing on demand. And um, there are a few places I would point to for that. You can start with the labor market. Um, so demand is still strong, uh, the demand side of the labor market in particular. But it's cooled from its extremely high level of a couple of years ago. And you see that in, in job openings. You saw it, uh, more evidence of that today in the JOLTS report, as you'll know. Uh, it's still higher than pre-pandemic, but it has been coming down both in the Indeed report and in the JOLTS report. That's, that's demand cooling. Neil Dutt over Renaissance Macro with this line. The statement retains its easing bias. Powell believes the policy is restrictive. Look at the price action off the back of this, Bramo. The next 60 minutes of that news conference, next 50 minutes, hardly worth your time. Well, especially because the next question was the question that was uh, the key one, popping the question that Julian Emanuel was talking about, which is, have you considered a hike? What, how big is the threshold? Not likely. We're not going to do that. So it was a one-two punch. First, policy was restrictive, dovish. Then hikes are not on the table. Even a bigger rally. And frankly, that's what's fueling. Basically, hawkish isn't as a vocabulary. And Goldman Sachs in their note, Hot Season Company in their note, started with the tapering action. I think it was a tandem. I agree with everything you've said. And it was over, John, after uh, not 40 seconds. I think it was over after 33 uh, seconds. But with that said, he delivered... A lot of what people wanted is an adjustment. You saw it in the real yield. It's come back a little bit. But you wonder what the follow is, the follow on is. The first set of Fed speakers out of the block. I mean, I mean are they gonna are they gonna go with this tone? It's been a fantastic lineup of guests over the last couple of hours. Just a shout out to Bob Michael at <coughs> JP Morgan and Mohammed Al Arian. Asked about stagflation. Do you remember Bob's response yep. to that? I think the chairman's gonna laugh at that. Reflect on what happened in the Volcker years. I think he's going to laugh. He said there's no stag, there's very little inflation. Ultimately, there's no stagflation. Basically, he laughed. He said, you know, give me a break. This is not what we're talking about. Honestly, this was a Fed chair that came out much more dovish than anyone had expected. And honestly, this raises a question about whether he is right. entertaining some of the key debates. He was asked by Michael McKee about long-term neutral rates, not going to engage it. Asked about long and variable lags, stick in a script. There was no sense that he had entertained a lot of the fundamental debates that are dividing Wall Street in a really serious way. And I'm not sure where that leaves people. I noticed that off the GDP, where we've got a 1.6% statistic, what we heard interview after interview was domestic final sales was actually pretty buoyant. And that's what he alluded to when he went after the stagflation. Let's be clear, they're not going to cut anytime soon based on what we just heard. The easing bias remains. It's just the amount of price action we've seen over the last couple of months. When we talked about the Fed chair being hawkish, it was hawkish relative to what? We've had this conversation all day. Relative to the previous meeting, maybe? Relative to the price action, where we're priced for right now? Very difficult to do. The bar for that was so high, given the fact that this market is only priced for one cut in 2024. Yeah, this didn't push against that. I mean, this could very much be consistent with only one rate cut. And that's why you're seeing a bigger move, arguably, in stocks than in bonds. Basically, this is the perfect mix for stocks, where people said you just need the tail risk of a hike off the table. He did that. And then you can really go to the races. When we get to Dudley, I'm going to talk about what wasn't talked about too much, which is the labor economy. What evidence do they need to see in the labor economy to really become accommodative? And to me, that's still really unanswered. I don't think it's claims. Maybe it's wages coming down a la Tom sure. Purcelli and others. But I, I just really wonder what the labor dialogue is here rather than the parlor game of what inflation is. TK, you're right, but I would pair that with inflation. I think oh, that's yeah, really got important. Well, they have to with these hot inflation prints temper their ability to respond to adverse right. shocks, the so-called Fed put. Based on what we just heard in the last 60 minutes, the Fed put is alive and well. Basically, stagflation's not on the table. Stop it already. And that's okay. basically what we heard. Can you set up a course where we have Frankfurt and London question quality 
brought over to Washington. Can you arrange that? Would you like me to offend everyone? No, I, I, I'm going to say it right now. There are too many questions that are off topic of the dual mandate of price change. Ethan Harris on fire on LinkedIn on this and on the labor economy. I didn't hear enough about the labor economy. I, I have to admit, I disagree with you. You're I going to defend the press I want to Ramo defend disagrees it. with me. That's I felt bad. like... After the first two questions, people tried every which angle to get something more. It wasn't happening, period, full stop. He was going to say what he was going to say, which is essentially we haven't shifted our stance that much. We're not going to hike rates. Goodbye. See you next time. Let's yeah. speak to a man who's been on the other end of some of these questions, Bill Dudley, former New York Fed president and Bloomberg Economics senior advisor. Bill, what did you make of that performance in that news conference? I think your interpretation is exactly right. It was quite dovish. I mean, he basically said that despite the news that's come in, economy stronger than expected, inflation not so good in the first three months of the year, the whole game plan is basically unchanged. We're going to keep rates here uh, until we're highly confident that we're going to get inflation down to 2%. No hint whatsoever of a rate hike. Uh, no hint that it's not going to work. Uh, so market reaction, I think, was pretty appropriate given what he said. Uh, you know, he basically said, we, we, we've got it. Back to Dudley McKelvey of a few years ago. Bill Dudley, you're in the trenches at Goldman Sachs gaming the labor economy. What data in the labor economy is important to Chairman Powell to really become accommodative? Well, I think it's the, the notion that the labor market is really starting to some, somehow fall apart and uh, the unemployment rate is starting to rise significantly. He was asked pretty explicitly about that, and he basically said one or two tenths of a percent rise in the unemployment rate wouldn't really disturb him. Uh, you know, I think the interesting question is if the labor market really starts to deteriorate, uh, you know, the problem is that the next stop typically is a, is a, is a, is a recession. Uh, we've never had a half a percent rise in the unemployment rate without having a recession. So I think it's, you know, if the unemployment rate goes up a couple of tenths, I don't think it really bothers them. But if it feels like the labor market is really giving way, then the Fed will put a lot of weight on that, almost regardless of what inflation is doing. Bill, you said something. He basically said, we got it. The playbook hasn't changed. Was that the right move? Well, time will tell uh, if, if the playbook is, it will actually work as, as well as, as, as he thinks. I mean, my own personal view is that the legs of monetary policy probably are not, not as long and, and variable as he thinks. And I put a lot more weight on financial conditions, I think, than he is currently. Uh, the fact that people are taking his comments uh, in a very positive way from from from, from a fi financial market perspective means that we're having an easing of financial conditions, which will support the economy. Uh, so I think it just reinforces the the higher for longer story over the over the medium term. He doesn't seem perturbed about that, and he also didn't really deal with a lot of the fundamental questions, as we were just saying, that have been dividing Wall Street. He didn't address the higher terminal rate. He didn't address this question of what would make him uh, really uh, second-guess the whole idea of restrictiveness or long and variable lags. Do you think that means he's not thinking about it or that he has rejected it, or do you think he just doesn't want to deal with it in the public right now? I think he's certainly thinking about it, but I think he's basically saying, from his perspective, the evidence hasn't convinced him that they're on the wrong track. So he, he thinks policy is restrictive, sufficiently restrictive to do the job. So maybe our, our star, you know, maybe the neutral rate is a little bit higher, but it's not as high as where they are today. So yes, could, could our star be revised up at the next uh, June summary of economic projections? Probably will be up, revised up a bit. But it, policy in his mind is still sufficiently tight that he's not worried about that particular variable. Bill Dudley, Ethan Harris has been on fire, retired from Bank of America, out almost daily on LinkedIn with really intelligent work on trim inflation means. Which inflation statistic is most informative now to our audience? Well, I like to focus on uh, services X housing uh, for two reasons. Uh, number one, this is the problem where the wage inflation drives the actual outcome in terms of services inflation. Uh, and number two, uh, you know, it, it's not being bounced around by, you know, the supply chain normalization process, which is pulling down its good prices. I think one of the things that's probably distorting the inflation news recently is the fact that goods prices came down a lot because of the normalization of supply chains. But if we ignore the transitory inflation on the way up, we also have to ignore it on the way down. So we don't want, we don't want to overstate that goods price inflation weakness. Uh, so I think services sector, X, X housing is probably a really th important thing to focus on. And, you know, that's the so-called last mile of inflation. And that's the, that's the part that's turning out to be more difficult 
But we need to talk to you about the balance sheet as well. So the Federal Reserve announcing today they'll slow the pace of balance sheet runoff starting in June. The central bank to lower the Treasury runoff cap to 25 billion from 60 billion. Bill, market participants right now trying to work out, OK, if QT wasn't bearish, is tapering QT bullish? But can you help me understand? Because we were told it's like watching paint dry. It has been. When they start to undo it and wind some of it, what does it all mean? I think it is like watching paint, right? You can see that in the press conference today. There were virtually no questions about the balance sheet. Uh, and he made it very clear that the balance sheet decisions are not a, a, a part of the monetary policy you know, process of, of making policy either, either e easier or tighter. Uh, I don't think it has much effect, uh, the, the taper, because the, the destination is the same. The Fed's going to a balance sheet size uh, that generates reserves that are ample, but not abundant like they are today. Uh, so may, we may get there slightly uh, over a longer period of time because we're now running off securities at a somewhat slow pace, but we're going to the same place. And so it really has virtually no market implications. If you were on the Fed still, Bill, would you have voted for this type of thing? Or would you have erred a little bit more, as you were talking about before, about financial conditions easing too much to allow inflation to stay sticky for too long? I don't think we're at the stage where you know rate hikes are warranted, and so I, I would have agreed with the decision today. I think where I would have uh, maybe bit differed from uh, Chair Powell a little bit is I would just be a little bit more cautious about the confidence that he that he's got it. Bill Dudley, thank you, sir. The former Fed, New York president. Bill, fantastic <clears throat> as always. Your equity market fades a little bit. We're up by three quarters of one percent. Lisa, I appreciated the question at the end of the news conference. I'm not sure about the answer. Because effectively what the journalist in that news conference was asking is whether the lack of dissent spoke to a lack of diversity of thought on the FOMC. Correct. They, was, they weren't asking about, you know, what gender and Precisely. What, you know, racial composition is on the Fed. They were asking about pushback, intellectual discourse, and this question about whether anyone was saying, hey, wait a second. Maybe we shouldn't be so sure that long and variable lags have the same kind of effect as they have in the past. That, I think, is a legitimate question. He didn't address a bunch of questions. Out here alluded to, and I think Bob Michael's been leading on this, and I mentioned Ian Lingen earlier, what if we get friendly data? What if we revert to a disinflationary vector? John, I'm doing some research here, and I mean, you know, I look at the G7 meeting in Puglia. Trying to make that here happen. Here in June, and yeah. I'm sorry, I got a plane ticket of $3,006, not even close to $7,000 eight, nine, ten months ago. I'm sorry, you get whispers of service sector disinflation, and you're right back to the boom economy, Dallas 500, what it was 10 minutes I'll ago. I'll repeat the question I asked a little bit earlier before the news conference started. I'll ignore the reference of the Dow. The three-month average on payrolls is 276. The Federal Reserve Chair has just established, conveyed quite clearly, that the Fed put is alive and well. They're willing to respond to adverse shocks, downside surprises, particularly if they emerge in the labour market. Now, I'm trying to wonder, Lisa, what it would take to reintroduce the rate cut conversation. Clearly, they still have a bias to ease, to cut interest rates. Would it be a downside surprise on Friday? Would that be sufficient? What would we need to see to get people talking about a different thing, not about hiking, about being sufficiently restrictive? After what we've just witnessed in that news conference, what would it take to have a series of guests to start talking about July at the Federal Reserve? And Jay Powell himself might have said, well, it would take a substantial weakening in the labor market. Does this market believe him that it really would or do they think that just the idea that, yes, quits rates are increasing, see a slight increase in the labor market? And then to Mohammed's point, if you already see the weakness, it's too late. How much does that haunt him at a time where he's really embracing the recovery that we continue to see in the economy? Mike McKee was in that news conference. Mike McKee has run out of that news conference. He's with us right now. Mike, great exchange with the Federal Reserve chairman in the last hour. What stood out for you? Well, I think that the biggest thing is that there are two audiences here or t uh, two people that or two things that the Fed is trying to address. One is the markets and their perception of what the Fed is doing. And the other is the economy and what they need to do to bring down inflation. And the two things are not always compatible. And that's maybe what you have right now. Uh, the Fed is less concerned about how the market feels about all this than they are with setting their own parameters within their meeting of what they think they need to do. And at this point, they don't think they need to do anything. The economy seems to be in good shape. Mm. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a slowdown, but we're supposed to see a slowdown when they raise rates. We have seen inflation stall out. Maybe that means they haven't got policy tight enough, but now financial conditions have tightened. And so maybe that's going to start to work. Bottom line, 
they don't know what they're going to do. So they can't then right. give the markets a good clue. Mike, in the fan distributions of all this data, the probabilities, the outcomes of all this data, is there in place into the jobs report on Friday an ability to get back to a disinflationary vector quickly? Uh, probably not in the sense that we don't have any indication that hiring is going to significantly slow uh, meeting any of the conditions that Jay Powell was talking about for a rate cut. And wages from all the other measures we've seen have still been running above inflation. So at this point, one indicator isn't going to do it. It would take much more than that. Uh, if we got a significant rise in unemployment for some reason, then that would set some antenna up, but uh, it wouldn't push anybody to do anything at this point. Mike, we talked a lot about how the key question was going to be whether they were entertaining the idea of rate hikes. Were you surprised that he completely dismissed that outright? No, I wasn't surprised because, uh, Lisa, you just have to play game theory and ask, what would have happened if he didn't dismiss it? Then all of a sudden you've got people really moving the markets around, trying to price for something like that. Uh, at this point, uh, the Fed doesn't see a reason to raise rates because they think that overall the economy is slowing a little bit as they want it to, and it is doing so without uh, rise in unemployment. So things are kind of working out the way they had planned. Mike McKee, great work as always, buddy. We'll catch up with you tomorrow morning. Mike McKee there, breaking it down for you down in Washington, D.C. That pop in the equity market, getting sold just a little bit. We're still yeah. positive, but Tom, only by 0.4%. Yeah. Can I go to November 7? November 7 is two days after a modest election. I'm sorry, but that's the meeting I'm focused on. November 7 could be wild. Hey, he was pretty direct nuts. about it in the news conference. They do not want to talk about politics. At all. Not part of the conversation. And they want to give the sense that they truly are independent at a time where they're actually being challenged in terms of their independence. The more people start talking about when people, I mean, the former President Trump comes out and starts talking about the potential for, you know, taking ownership over Fed decision making, yeah. they're going to be that much more adamant about being I'm waiting for him to address that story that came out from the journal in the last week. Still anonymous sources around the president talking about these issues. These are big issues. Don't you feel like people are kind of like spitballing out there and seeing how the people react to Trouble. it? Before they, yeah, yeah, before they really kind of put any emphasis behind it. Jeff Rosenberg's got things to say about this. Joins us now from BlackRock. He really doesn't. That. Stick with us, Jeff. I'm not going there. <laughs> Don't worry. Jeff, it's great to catch up with you as always, sir. After what you just My heard, best. does it make you incrementally more bullish in any way, shape or form? Well, let's just say that going into this meeting, there was a lot of bearishness and fear that he would come out uh, more hawkish. If you even look at, you know, Bloomberg Economics uh, put out their kind of preview, it was overwhelmingly expecting a very hawkish message. So I think there's a lot of relief here mm -hmm. that the chairman stayed true to what we've seen from this chairman. He's been very much on the other side, has been one sided looking at the glass half uh, full and 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 reiterating, you know, kind of the key point around an asymmetric response function. If inflation is higher and it has been higher over the last three months, okay, we won't cut as soon as we were anticipating. But the questions and people <clears throat> who tried to pigeonhole them on, are you going to hike? Did you talk about hikes? Right. You know, just deflected all of that, and that was a that was a relief. So the reiteration on the asymmetry, as a result of the reiteration on they. They believe that policy is sufficiently restrictive. Those are two key things here that keeps a more dovish orientation in the face of some challenging economic data. Jeff Rosenberg, on planet BlackRock, is the economy doing okay? Is the real misestimation here a 1.6% GDP, which made a lot of news, but domestic final sales were much, much better. Is it better out there than we actually think? And that's why we're heard of dovish Powell today. Well, I, I think you have a mixture there, and you've heard it, you know, as part of the exchange during the Q&A. Uh, you know, in the aggregate data, yes, 1.6 understates it, because as you rightly point out, if we look at domestic demand, it's running at a stronger level. So the economy in aggregate terms is stronger. Uh, but what Bob Michelle talked about in the earlier, or Michael, I'm not sure which way you pronounce it, uh, <laughs> talk about uh, is, you know, there are pockets. Was and, that some BlackRock shade? Yes. Is that what that was? That was 100%. I appreciate people. <laughs> 
can, I can confirm it's Michael. Carry on, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so there are pockets of, of hurt going on here, but there are also pockets of strength. So you have a distributional aspect in terms of what's going on in terms of the economic growth side, but clearly the amount of slowing, it was a question in the Q&A, didn't you need to have more pain to get the disinflation? Good news is we're still on the path of the immaculate disinflation and the growth side is, is holding up. So I think that's quite supportive here to the risky asset perspective. It seems like this is more supportive to the risky assets than it is to uh, government bonds, right? I mean, this basically raises the specter of taking a, a rate hike off the table, which will benefit stocks of companies that have done really well with respect to earnings, but doesn't necessarily give that much of a boost to government bonds that are still subject to higher for longer. Is that kind of your view in terms of positioning on the heels of this, on the margin? Yeah, and, and you know, I think we have to segment between the front end of the curve and the back end of the curve. Uh, when, you know, I think this is challenging for the long run in the back end of the curve, right? The Fed is, is from the most part, dismissive of the inflation increase. They're not really taking it in too much into account. The characterization of it was, was bumpy, what me worry. So that's fine. But if you're holding 30 years of debt at interest rates that, you know, may not sufficiently compensate you if you are at a longer period of a 3% inflationary period, that's a bit challenging and a little bit problematic. I think for the front end of the curve, you know, it, 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 it's a little bit easier story because you have less exposure because of the maturity and roll down that you benefit from there. Uh, but I think you have to be a little bit concerned about the longer run trajectory here, both from what we heard today in terms of monetary policy, but the other side of this, uh, which we heard a little bit this morning in terms of Treasury refunding on the fiscal side, that's a bit more of a challenging environment for back end duration. Hey, Jeff, I want to build on that just a little bit. Given how established the reaction function is now at the Federal Reserve, highlighted again by the chairman in this news conference, how do you think yields will respond to the longer end to incoming information, the data on Friday, an upside surprise versus, say, a downside surprise? Yeah, you know, we're going to we're going to pivot right to Friday and uh, we'll be back and we'll talk to you guys then. But, you know, I think that will very much be more about the front end reaction, uh, because that's going to be about is the Fed really getting the slowdown in the labor markets, uh, the, the, the normalization in the labor markets that they keep talking about. But the data isn't really supportive. Non-farm payroll is not supportive. Wage is not supportive. Right. I'm a little surprised you didn't get more pushback on ECI, their favorite measure. Everybody expected it to go down. It went up. Yes, we can dismiss it. It had special factors. It was a bit more state and local. It was a little bit more union than, than private. But it didn't go down as fast as the normalization would say. And there is that kind of lurking question. Mike McKee, you asked it. You know, are you not as restrictive as you think you are? And they'll continue to believe that they are restrictive. That's kind of the fundamental uh, uh, belief at this point. The question is, if the data keeps pushing against that, then does the Fed have to make a bigger pivot? Today was not that day. Way too soon mm -hmm. to get there. And that's why Powell purposefully came out very dovish. But inside the statement, one thing people, one questioner picked up on, there are a little bit of hints here of, of, of moving around. The removal of the of kind of the implicit forward guidance on the peak policy rate, the implicit promise that the next move would be a cut in the introductory statement. Um, I think that's notable. We'll see that in the minutes in terms of the debate. And what, we, what the chairman obviously couldn't talk about here, but next month we will talk about, is the shifting in the distribution of the voting members with respect to right. their forecasts of economic policy. That you didn't get this meeting, but obviously that's what the markets wants to see. And you can kind of read into the statement and the, and the press conference that there is a shift going on there. It was underplayed. Not really many people picked up on it. He wasn't going to highlight it, but you can see that is going on. BlackRock's Jeff Rosenberg. Great to catch up with you, sir. The shade of J.P. Morgan from BlackRock. <laughs> oh, stop. Do you think they call Rick, Rick Ryder? <laughs> You know, over, at, over at J.P. Morgan. It's a fair mischaracterization. You think that was intentional? That was your takeaway from Absolutely all the Fed coverage? Absolutely was that intentional. Bob, Mich Are you Michelle? joking? Oh, of course goodness. it was. Uh, they don't know who Bob, Bob Michael is. Give me Jeff. a break. This S&P 500 <laughs> is fading going into the close. Let's bring up the chart briefly. We're up now by only a tenth of 1% at the peak. In that news conference, the S&P 500 was positive by 1.2. Something that sticks, though. Interestingly, 
here, Lisa, is the, the running in bonds, the two-year, still down by about eight basis points. It took the prospect of hikes off the table, so that potential uh, tail risk, not necessarily there. I thought what Jeff Rosenberg said, though, about the long end was interesting, and we're not seeing it in the price action at all. Same. But that in the longer run, this becomes a real problem for the long end. Essentially, if you have a Fed that is hardwired to cut rates on any weakness, but not necessarily to hike rates on the sense of any kind of durability of inflation, does that mean that inflation is going to stay higher for longer and that there needs to be a higher risk premium? I was pleased you took the conversation there, Lisa. This from Mohammed Al Arian out on X, formerly known as Twitter, X, with this to say, the question now, this is an important one, which will only be answered in a few weeks when the meeting's minutes are released, is the extent to which his remarks reflect his own biases or constitute an accurate summary of what was discussed by him and his FOMC colleagues. And the Fed speak's going to start pretty immediately, Tom. Almost straight after this, going into payrolls, we're going to hear from Fed officials. I agree. The Fed speak's important. If we get a 240 on survey on non-farm payrolls, three months trailing, 240, 303, 270. That's a fully employed America. Well, and you raised a real interesting question, which is essentially, is there now a new asymmetry in the market where the long end will sell off disproportionately if we do get a really big or hot print in the labor market? Essentially, the Fed's not going to look at this as a reason to hike or even to keep rates higher for longer necessarily, but it could mean longer term there could be a much more inflationary pressure under the hood. Really important stuff ahead of payrolls on Friday. As Tom mentioned, the estimate in our survey, 240,000. The previous number, 303. Coming up next on The Close, counting you into that, about 15 minutes away, Seth Carpenter, Chief Global Economist at Morgan Stanley. For the three of us, we'll see you again. Same time, same place for the next Federal Reserve decision. From New York City, this was The Fed Decides.